back in our summer series, taking a, 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 taking a break from the book of Proverbs, and we're looking at being a disciple. The last couple of weeks, we've, we've got started here. What the, we're looking at what does a disciple do? Remember that in a spiritual sense, a disciple is one who is a, it can't be more than a Christian, but that's the phrase I'm using, a little bit more than a Christian. They're not just saved, they're changed. They're not just satisfied with being uh, born again. They are following, actively following the Lord. In other words, they don't just have salvation. Salvation has them. They don't just have Jesus. Jesus has them. You see the, one of the, the, the verse at the top, uh, verse 26 of Luke 14, but uh, the verse, if any man come unto me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children, those two are easy sometimes, and brethren and sisters, by the way, if those two are easy for you, come back on Sunday nights. We're talking about the family, and maybe we can help you with that. Brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And we've talked a little about how there are requirements if we're going to be a disciple. There are no requirements if we're going to be a Christian, and we're going to look at that a little bit today. What is a disciple? We told you the dictionary defines it as a follower, a student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. Spiritually speaking, we're a personal follower of Jesus Christ. Based on what Jesus has said about being a disciple, a generic little definition, not comprehensive, one who puts into practice and does what he says, speaking of Jesus, and is willing to make the sacrifices it takes to be what he wants. Really, every Christian should be a disciple. Every Christian. It's sad to say not every Christian is. Not every Christian actively follows after Jesus Christ. Every Christian should. Oscar, can I get a little bit more up on my monitors? Thank you. This month, we're going to be looking, we're going to be starting in a week, uh, looking at stewardship on the Sunday morning services. But there's a difference between discipleship and stewardship. Discipleship is who I am supposed to be as a Christian who follows Christ. In other words, a discipleship, that's I'm supposed to be a disciple. And discipleship means I'm learning how to be a disciple and be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's the what of everything I do as a Christian. Stewardship is really who Christ is in relation to everything in my life. Basically, simply put, he's the owner. He possesses everything, and he has entrusted us with that. And so stewardship is the why of everything I do. Why do I live my life for Christ? Why don't I live it for myself? Because I understand that everything, including my life, was given to me by God. And because of that, I should live for him. And so we've looked at some of those concepts. Tonight, I want to tie our, our little series on being a disciple to our steps of growth. Okay, not going to go through the discipleship book. We're going to look through some of our steps of growth and kind of dig a little bit deeper to help us to be uh, successful in these areas. Why do we go over it in church? Why would we? Why do we need it? Um, first of all, because all of us are supposed to understand it. We want to grasp it. I mean, we have it on the wall. It's not just a banner. It's what we are promoting people to do. Also, so we can help others. We think of Brother Winkler here, a missionary, called to go to Estonia to reach people there. You know, all of us in a small sense are supposed to be missionaries here. God gives you the specific place he wants you to do it if you are called and he's sending you somewhere. But really, uh, for all of us, I uh, say, so, well, I'm not a missionary called anywhere. Yeah, you are. You're saved. If you're living here, you're a missionary here. You're supposed to be reaching people here. And, and more than just sharing the gospel with them. Someone gets saved and they cut, either if you win them to the Lord or they come into our church, we don't want just people to get saved. One of the things we're doing is trying to help us to understand being a disciple, but also want us to understand what it takes so we can help others that come into our church to progress. I, I'm not going to use faith journey. I can't stand it. This is a neo term. But to progress and grow in their Christian life. Taking steps. We need to understand that. Steps don't automatically ensure that you'll be a true disciple, but they are a path or encouragement to become and grow as one. 
There's no magic formula, okay? It's, 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 it's growing in our relationship with Christ. But we've identified, identified some specific things in our church we can do to help somebody come. When someone walks in our church, I want them to know, I want, to, I want them to know and I want us to know, where are you at spiritually? And what is the next step along that path that you need to take? And that's what it's all about. We must be, con- we must be constantly... I think you have a blank in your your sheet right there. Jesus did not just want us, Jesus did not just want us to be only disciples. He wants us to be disciples who are disciplers. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Do you want me to, to teach in our discipleship on Thursday night through my Sunday school class? Some people will do that. But really as a Christian, you ought to be able, if you meet somebody who's a newer Christian or somebody that's newer in their faith, you ought to be able to encourage them in their faith. They ought to be able to to talk to you and you should be able to talk to them and encourage them. I've mentioned many times as a new Christian walking into church, um, there were many of the older men in the church I met there who in certain ways tried to encourage me in my faith and push me down that path to grow. The first time I ever went soul winning, the assistant pastor asked me to go personally. He said, we, we go, they, their soul winning program was a little different than ours, but he said, I, I need a partner to go. They went on Thursday night. Will you go with me? I said, I'll be there. I'll meet you at church. He goes, no, no, I'll pick you up. I'm like, no, no, I'll, I'll meet you at the church. And he would not let me meet him at church. He was insistent upon picking me up. Anybody want to know why? Pressure. <laughs> okay, to make sure I'm here. And sure enough, he picked me up and took me out. And from that time forth, I went every Thursday. Okay? I remember the guy that ran the little bookstore there. Just I'd go back there and I'd buy sermon tapes and I'd look at the books. And he took an interest in me and said, you ought to read this book. And he'd teach me some things. He taught me about prayer. He goes, you need, you need to learn about prayer. He goes, let me give you this book. And he gave me the book by John R. Rice on prayer. He said, you read this book. It will really help you with your prayer life. And so we ought to all be able to encourage and help others But if we don't understand it ourselves, we won't get there. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now notice the progression here. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Now, we're big around here about a multi-generational vision, okay? Having a church that stays true to the word of God so that our children have a place years down the line that's straight and so that when they have children, their children will have a place to come and so they're propagating the faith to their family person by person going down. Well, there's a spiritual multi-generational vision. It's right here, notice it. And the things that thou hast heard of me. Now he's talking to Timothy, but who's the me? Paul. Paul's the first one. Paul's the first, if if we were looking at the generations here with Timothy, although Timothy had uh, 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 a saved mother and grandmother, but on the spiritual side, he had Paul. Things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou, who's thou? That would be Timothy. He's number two. So Paul, and Paul is training Timothy. Two faithful men. Timothy is supposed to train faithful men. Okay? That's three. Who shall be able to teach others also? The faithful men one day will share their faith, and they'll encourage people, others also. Four generations. Father, grandfather, wait a minute. Father, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, sons, they're all down the road. Four generations, okay? Four generations. He had to know or else he couldn't help the faithful men. And the faithful men had to know or else they couldn't teach the others also. That's what a disciple will do. He will share. We must always remember that about Jesus and his disciples. Jesus was not enamored with crowds. Now, he had crowds that followed him. Many of the time, many times they'd follow him for the wrong reason, okay? But Jesus didn't want crowds. He wanted commitment. 
The key word in discipleship, it's right there on your paper, is this, commitment. Commitment. Jesus wanted people to follow who were committed. The word that's bandered about so often in our society is, I'm a follower of Jesus. And most people that say they follow Jesus have no idea where Jesus is going. It's just a new term. But we really should be followers of Jesus. And if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, <clears throat> the main ingredient is commitment. We have to be committed. Commitment, growth, in, in our commitment we can grow, and that growth comes in steps. We've said this on many times over the years. Growth means change, doesn't it? If we're going to grow, we need to change. And so... For the next couple of weeks, we're going to kind of go through the steps we have up there and just share a few thoughts so we have an understanding of, the, of it so we can also share it with others, and it's firm in our mind. First of all, our first step, of course, and our, our first main category is loving God. There's two steps to that. Let's look at the first one. Look at number one. Everything about it, and we referenced it two weeks ago, everything about it starts with salvation. It starts with salvation. You can't have a Christian life if you've not become a Christian. Okay? Salvation is a stepping stone. It's the beginning. Let me give you a couple thoughts of that. Letter A. It's the starting point in your relationship with God. Starting point. Without, trust, without trusting Jesus Christ, you don't have a relationship with him. Okay, we need to understand that. It starts and ends with Jesus Christ. By the way, if it's going to happen, we need to understand who Jesus is. You talk to a lot of people. They'll say, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, what do they mean by that? They believe that there was a, a person who, who, uh, who lived on this earth one time, and his name was Jesus Christ. You know? Some of them, if they saw the Charlie Brown Christmas special, they know that uh, he was born to be the savior of the world. But they can't connect the dots and figure out what that means. That's just something they've heard. Too many people believe in a Jesus of their own making. They don't, they don't put him in the context that the way the Bible would place him. That's very important. We need to understand it's the biblical Jesus. Look at a couple things just briefly about Jesus here. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, and, and the Word was with God, I'm sorry, and the Word was God. You look through John chapter 1, you, you learn several things about Jesus Christ that help us understand who he is. First of all, we, the, this teaches us that Jesus is eternal. Okay, Jesus didn't just happen on whatever, Christmas Day in the manger. Jesus always was. Jesus was eternal. Why? A couple things here. Next little bullet, this teaches us about the Trinity. I didn't have a grasp, and the tr Trinity is a thing that's a little difficult to understand sometimes or, or comprehend it completely in our mind. But, but, uh, I remember I, I, I had no idea what that meant. I remember early on in my Christian life, I went to a, a Bible study, and, and the assistant pastor was filling in for the pastor, and he taught a whole lesson on the Trinity, showed us a scripture. I thought, that's good, okay? Jesus is part of the Trinity. Next, this teaches us about his deity. Is the battery going on this? It, it sounds a little weird up here. I was, I was just going to say, maybe it's me. No, I doubt that seriously. It, it must be you. This teaches us about his deity. What does deity mean? Jesus Christ is God. He is God. John 1.14. Remember we said the word was with God and the word was God. It tells us there, but we know it's referenced in Jesus. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so 
Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Listen, if he's not all of these things the Bible said he is, and we don't believe he's all the things the Bible said he is, then he could never have been the Savior, and, and, and we would be still in our sins to this day. And also the last thing, this teaches us about his humanity. He was 100% God in 100% flesh. That's, by the way, that's why it's important that it was the virgin birth. If he would have had a regular father like anybody else, he would be a sinner. Romans teaches us sins passed down through the father. Okay? That's why uh, it was a uh, popular preacher. He's kind of got off the side now when he's liberals. And he said, it doesn't matter if Jesus was born of a virgin. If we found out that he had a father and his father's name was Harry, that wouldn't change anything. It would change everything. That's just, that's just rank heresy. But we need to understand who Jesus is. But the key when it comes to salvation is in verse 12 of John chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we trusted Christ, we were born into God's family. And now we are a child of God, and our eternity is settled. That's what it means a bit in John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's funny. Nicodemus sneaks in to see Jesus at night. He wants to talk to him. And Jesus doesn't even, doesn't even have a conversation, you know. He didn't use the help outline or any of that stuff you do in soul winning. He's just like, you need to be born again. <laughs> right up front. Well, he knew that's what Nicodemus needed. And Nicodemus was there because he was open. Jesus just laid it on him. You need to be born again. And when we trust Christ as Savior, we become his child and we're born again. You know, sometimes you ever met, so, meet, met somebody, you ever meet somebody, they say, oh, I've always been a Christian. Really? That's like saying, I've always been a person. No, I've not always been a person. I became a person the day I was born. There was a certain place. Actually, the place is right down the street. It's not Pacific Hospital anymore. So called something else. It used to be Pacific Hospital. By the way, how many of you have ever been there lately? The place is empty. You go there and visit someone in the hospital. I was visiting someone in the hospital. It's like I got lost, and it was like empty rooms everywhere. So I just went and took a nap for a while. I was kind of tired, you know. But Pacific Hospital, I was born at Pacific Hospital on a certain day, okay? Certain time. Do you remember it? No, my mom remembered it, though. I don't remember it, but I was. And there was a certain day I was born again. Now, I remember that one, Easter Sunday, 1978, Gethsemane Baptist, that time, temple. Okay? So when you're saved, you'll know it. Now, some people get saved, and they may not remember the exact day. I mean, they remember what had happened. Maybe the day just escaped their mind. Remember, when we were starting a church, six months before we started the church here, we were visiting in the, in the Cambodian community, getting prospects, and there was this one old, old gentleman. He had, you know, just escaped the killing fields recently, and he's in, um, he's in Long Beach, California, and we asked him, you know, he said, um, he was, his English wasn't good. It's like, when were you born? And here's what was his answer. Wednesday. They asked, well, what year? He goes, I don't remember. They didn't keep track of that stuff. He just knew it was a Wednesday. Okay, but there's a day that you're born again. So it starts with salvation. Letter B, it's the, it's the foundation of your new life on this earth. So you get saved now, but wait a minute, that's not the end. It's now the laying the foundation for us to have a new life on this earth. I've said that salvation is not the end of the matter. It's the beginning. It's not the end game. I think so often we, we give up on, oh, they got saved. They'll be in heaven. That's not the end of it. Now there's a lot of good stuff they can be involved with. Now there's a lot of great things God can do in their life. We do somebody a disservice sometimes when we don't encourage them to find out what those good things are. It's the beginning. Now, it's the end of our path to hell, thank God. Inside the package of salvation, they give a blank, is the power to transform us to a new life. God didn't just, he, you know, salvation is God saving us from our sins eternally. But once we're saved, 
Salvation now allows us to have victory over our sin on this earth. We have that power. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You know, sometimes someone gets saved and like right off the bat, boom, skyrocket. All the things. You know, really, that should be more the norm than, than, than not. People really understand. Now, I understand sometimes that's not the case. I got saved and did nothing for two years. I knew I was saved. God was dealing with me for two years. But it took two years to get through my head that there was something more to this thing. And God dealing with me before I jumped in, I committed. Okay? And there's good things going on there. God has given us a plan for what he wants us to do after we're saved. Look at these verses, the verse in Ephesians. It says, for we are his workmanship. Workmanship needs new product. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, we know what the two verses before this verse are. It's the verses on salvation. You're saved through, through faith, and it's not of your own. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, after he gives us the verses on salvation, the very next verse says, I got a purpose for you already. Once you're saved, you're a whole new person. You're a new product. What? To do good works. God has a purpose for us. God has a plan for our life. And it's more than just ourself. Yes, he changes our life. But he also changes it so we can be involved in serving him and helping others. We're missing it out. So many people miss out on what God has for them for their life. They miss it. You know, we settle for less than, get, than what God wants us to have. We go about, we struggle in our lives, and yet we're saved, and we don't have to struggle. And I understand there's a struggle per se. We fight the flesh every day. We have problems we got to deal. I understand all that. I'm saying we struggle to the point where we lose the battle, or we don't even fight the battle. We don't have to. We can have victory. God has something better for us. We don't, we, don't, we don't receive salvation by works, but the result of our salvation will be works. By the way, if you're new and you're coming around here and you're coming to the services, you're on a Thursday night, thank God for that, you're growing, you need to take, if you're not serving somewhere, take that next step. Find what God has for you. We'll, we'll be more than glad to help you with that. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Why in the world would we want to live in sin and then excuse it by saying we're under grace? We're not here to talk about grace, but really the grace of God teaches us we have victory and power to live over sin. Not to excuse our sin and revel in it. It's not how it works. Let me read these verses and give you a couple thoughts here, and we'll probably have to finish with this. Look at Luke chapter 8 there, the maniac of Gadara, a great picture of what salvation does. They arrived in the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time, and wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. This guy had issues. But when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment thee not. These are the, the demons that are in him. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oft times it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and fetters. And he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus said, asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him, the devils, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. But there, went, but there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. They said, let us, we don't, don't just kick us. Let us go into these, these, these pigs, for better, lack of a better term. And the devils went out of the man, 
out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. There was enough of them in him to, to take the whole, the whole herd out. And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it to the city and the country. And they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the seven devils was departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And it's amazing. They were afraid of the guy when he was running around and breaking free from his bands and living in the tombs, and now the guy is cleaned up and completely changed, and they're afraid again. They, they, it's like you can't please some people. They also, which saw it, told them by what means he that was possessed of the devil was healed. They told him Jesus did it. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadolines round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the seven de devils was departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Notice the difference. This man lived, of course he was possessed by a devil, I get it, but just lived with constant drama in his life. From problem to problem, being taken around everywhere. And yet now, salvation made him completely calm. That was over. He sat at Jesus' feet. He had issue with clothing. By the way, some people do in the summer. Let's not be like that. And now he's clothed. He was in his right mind. Some of you say, I have a son. Maybe he meets, needs to meet Jesus. I get that. He's in the right mind. Okay? All the garbage, all the nonsense that's going on. Now he's set straight. He wanted to be with Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? Go tell other people. I mean, a drastic change. Scared some people. By the way, you know, when you get saved and God works in your life, it scares some, it'll scare some of your family members. You ever had that? It's like, what happened to you? Remember before I was saved, I worked for my dad, and, and I was just, I was a punk, you know, and I'd work for him, and, and he's like, man, you need to calm down. You need to straighten out, and, and he did not live with my mom, and I live with my mom. He's like, man, what is wrong? Cut your hair, you know, do this. That was an issue, cut your hair. Wish I had that problem nowadays, but I don't. He's like, man, cut your hair. What are you listening to? What's going on? Watch your language. The whole nine yards. I quit working for him. During that time, I, I got right with God. I, got, I started going to church, and God transformed my life. He needed someone to help him, so I went back working for him. He's like, what's wrong with you? Look at you. Your hair's too short. I'm, lis I'm listening to Christian stuff on the radio. He's like, what are you listening to? He's like, what is going on here? It just totally confounded him. Oh, well, I was nice and kind, but it's like, where do you, you want me to go back to the other life? I don't know what you want here. But I'm glad he noticed that something was different. By the way, when people notice something is different, you can draw them to Christ. It wasn't long after that, I took my mom and my aunt and my grandmother, they came to church with me. And, and, and on Thursday, uh, Thursday morning, the ladies would go, and um, I don't know why I was home that day. I think I was between jobs. But they came by, and they went to my grandmother's house, and they went to my aunt's house, which was right down the street from ours, and they got saved. And then they were coming down to our house to see my mom. And my aunt called and said, hey, people from the church are going to come see you. Not scaring her, just saying, they just came to our house. And they came in, and, and pastor's wife witnessed to my mom, and she got saved. But one of the things she mentioned, she says, I don't know what's happened to this kid, but he's different. I'm glad she noticed something was different. I'm glad when the pastor's wife came over, she couldn't say, if that's what a Christian is, keep it. Okay? What happens? When we get saved, that's not the end. It's the beginning of a wonderful, wonderful journey we take with the Lord, and he changes our life. And I encourage you to get involved with that. Let's pray. We're done.